Genesis 21, verse 9. Are you there? And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocked. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, not with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of the bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, listen to your wife. <laughs> Hearken to her. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. I want to preach a little while this morning from the subject of the miracle and the mistake. The miracle and the mistake. Not just the miracle and not just the mistake. But I want you to notice that in this passage of Scripture, you have a miracle and you have a mistake. And I want to preach about both of them. Genesis 15, verse 6 will be the Scripture we leave up there the entire time. And he believed in the Lord, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. When we talk about Abraham, the father of faith, we gather here on this Father's Day, I felt like he would be a great character to preach about. Because many things that happen in Abraham's life, you can read it and you can apply it to your life. Not just as a father, but as a human being. As a person on this planet that sometimes struggles to believe God the way you need to believe God. Carlene and I were going down the road the other day and I did something she had never heard me do before. I began to pray for our faith. And she said, when I did that, that it ministered to her. Have you ever just needed God to give you some fresh faith for issues you were facing, for battles you were fighting? And it was one of the first times in my life when Carly and I gathered together because sometimes when you're going through the battle, you just need God to touch your faith. The Bible said in the book of Acts when the church gathered together, they did it for the confirmation of their faith because they were living in an era that was hostile to their faith. They were living in a community that tried to talk them out of their faith. They were surrounded by neighbors that made fun of them for their faith. And you read that in the book of Acts, but yet you fast forward to 2018 America. And it's much like the climate going on in our culture today. There are voices trying to talk you out of your faith. Talk shows trying to talk you out of your faith. Intellectuals trying to talk you out of your faith. And above all that, you've got battles going on inwardly. Trying to get you to give up believing in God. Trying to get you to release that thing that you need God to do. And so we come to church sometimes because we need God to touch our faith. And the very fact you got here means you got enough faith to make it through. Because my God said if you had faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, I try to tell somebody it's not the size of your faith. It's the object of your faith. And if the object of your faith is Jesus, you go See, I can have a little bit of faith that if I put my arm on this, it'll hold me up. So really, the issue ain't the amount of my faith. The issue is the sturdiness of the object. Woo! The problem with today's world is we got people putting faith in things that don't hold up when life gets tough. We got people putting faith in things that when life gets tough, it lets them down. If you're going to make it, you better put your faith in Jesus. Because when the storm's over and the dust is settled, he's still going to be standing there. Am I talking to anybody that Jesus has shown himself faithful in your life? He is the object of your faith. And so many times the enemy will come to you when you're in the battle path. And he'll try to point out the, the weaknesses of your faith and the flaws of your faith. But the Bible said that Jesus is the author and the finisher of my faith. Which means that the God that started this thing in me, he's going to finish this thing in me. That even when I struggle, I'm going to be okay. Because God is the one writing my story. I'm preaching to some people today that are in the battle. And you're in the battle because... Faith has been tried so many times. Carly will tell me, a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And so many times the forces you lean on when you're going through battle are people that have had their faith tried in the fire. 
See, when you're going through something, you don't want to hear from somebody that's got an opinion. You want to hear from somebody that's got an experience. Because I found out opinions are like armpits. Everybody's got a couple. But when I'm going through hell, I want to hear through from somebody that's been there and made it. If I'm going through darkness, I want to be around somebody that's pushed on to the light. If my marriage is in trouble, I ain't going to get my counsel from somebody that ain't never been married. I want somebody that's been there 30 years through the good, the bad, the ugly. If I'm sick, I want to hear from somebody that got healed. If I'm depressed, I need to hear from somebody that got delivered. And that's why when we gather together, the anointing is released when you begin to hear from people that have been through what you're going through. Because when you get in that stage of isolation, the enemy has a way of making you think you're the only one that's ever had them doubts. Woo! You're the only one that's ever had them struggles. You're the only one that's ever had those fears. But when you come to the house of God, you begin to realize I'm not in this thing alone. There are other people that have battled the way I've battled. There are other people that have bled the way I've bled. And God has brought you here today because when you come to church, we're all one to recover something. And see how many honest people I've got in here. We're all one to recover something that we feel like the enemy stole from us. We're all one to get something back that we used to have that we don't have anymore. Or we're all recovering from something that we've been through. Way back if you've been through something this last year and you're still healing up from it. Church is the one place you ought to be able to be honest. Sometimes we come to church because we got the wind knocked out of us and we need to recover. We had the props knocked out of us and we need to recover. We went through some things we can't talk about, but we come to recover. So whether if I'm trying to recover something that was stolen from me, or I'm trying to recover from something that was done to me, we're all in recovery mode today. We gathered at the Father's house. Hoping he can help us recover. Somebody shout back, recover. Because anytime you open these church doors, there's somebody recover. They could be recovering from the loss. They could be recovering from mistakes they made. They could be recovering from the opinions of man. But they came to lift up their hand and say, God, help me recover. Help me get back the joy. It was David that said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. It fascinates me to know Jonas, David never said restore to me my salvation because he hadn't lost it. But he said, I've lost my joy and I need it back. Have you ever been through times where you're still saved but you say, I wish I had my joy back. I wish I had my faith back. I wish I had my shout back. And that is the situation that he is in. When you begin to study the life of Abraham, you study somebody that his main great gift that we brag about thousands of years later it wasn't that he could leap a mountain. It wasn't that he wrestled with a lion and beat him. The great thing about Abraham with all his weaknesses and frailties and insecurities, what made Abraham stand out is in a world contradictory to God, he dared to believe in God. And because he believed in God, God said, I will count that for righteousness. When you study the story of Abraham, you see that God came to a man that had nothing to offer God. But God had everything to offer Abraham. I worry about people that come into this thing feeling like they are doing God a favor. Let me help you. You ain't doing God a favor. God did you the favor. God didn't need you. You needed him. Amen. And get no help from him. He comes to a 75-year-old man. No way he can reproduce in the natural. And God says, I'm going to make you a promise where you believe it. And Abraham look, didn't look at his circumstance. Help me, Holy Ghost. He didn't look at his dead body. He didn't look at the scientific evidence. Abraham listened to the voice of God and he said, I'm going to believe you. What is faith? Faith is said, I won't let what I see talk me out of what God said. Because all of life is geared to cause what you see to talk you out of what God said. God said, you're a healer. But your body says, I don't feel it. God said, I'm a way maker. The kids start acting crazy. And here's where faith gets stuck because sometimes we let the situation talk to us. God never called us to let the situation talk to us. God called us to talk to the situation. God never said, tell him about your mountain. God said, tell your mountain about your God. And real faith is when you stand up in front of adversity and say, devil, you won't have my family. You won't have my ministry. And you won't have my faith. Hey, how you ever been there? Have you ever had to talk to stuff? Faith is when you talk.
talk to stuff that don't seem like you here. Faith is when you stand on empty property and say, I declare a church. Faith is when you stand in front of a shattered family and say, I declare healing. Faith is not letting the circumstances talk to you. Faith is you talking to the circumstances. God didn't come into darkness and let darkness tell him how dark it was. God stepped into darkness and said, let there be light. Somebody said the preachers don't believe in the big bang theory. Yeah, I do. I believe God stepped out in the darkness and let there be light. Bang, light happened. If that's what you call it. I believe that. I believe that all day long. But I don't believe nothing created something. I don't believe I was an amoeba in a pond that crawled out, swam from a vine, and became human. I believe in divine design. I'm just going to go. Evolution is a stupid. That's me. Somebody just say stupid. Yeah. It would be as stupid as me looking at this water bottle. Okay? Water bottle. Do you believe some gases got together, combusted, and this was produced? If I told you I believe, and this is just a stinking water bottle. If I told you I believe when nobody was looking, there was a bang and a water bottle came. Y'all say Barry's had a nervous break. Y'all would say that's preposterous, wouldn't you? But yet we let people teach us that all this came from a bang and we believe that like that's teaching. That ain't teaching, baby. That's lying. The Bible said professing to be, uh, be wise, they became fools. And we live in an hour where, where there are people in classrooms trying to teach people that you're nothing more than an animal, that you're nothing more than a monkey. And then we wonder why kids start acting like animals and shoot themselves in hallways. Because if you don't teach people that they are made in the image and in the likeness of God, that they came from God, and one day they shall return to God, then don't get whipped out when they don't act like nothing. Don't you tell somebody, baby, you are too good to put a needle in your set people free. Hopelessness has settled down on this nation because we've allowed the wrong voices to speak. And the right voices have been silent. So I ain't talking Democrat, Republican. I'm talking the spirit that is released on this age to talk people out of faith. What do I have if I don't have God? What does it mean if there is no creation? What does it mean if there is no God? That is with me in the storm. And somebody came. And all you need to take out of this today is God is with you. God is real. And God will show himself strong on your behalf. If you're in agreement with that, would you give the Lord a hand up and pray? I said, God is with you. And God's going to bring you through. Hey, and now I know your faith is weak. But God ain't going to fail you. And when you get to the other side, you're going to say, not by might, no by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Your faith will be tried. Your faith will be tested. And God came to Abraham that had no evidence that anything could be different. But he made him a promise. And Abraham said, I believe. My question unto you today is, are you going to believe the report of the Lord? That gives you hope. Or are you going to believe these lying voices that have been released upon this generation trying to talk people out of meaning and out of purpose? Trying to make you believe your family ain't going to get better but get worse because the battle is for your faith. And Abraham said, though I see no outward evidence, I believe the voice of my God. And God said, that's good enough for me. Yeah. And God began to walk with Abraham. Abraham began to walk with God. Yeah. Abraham believed God could do it in him. But the breakdown happens when Abraham starts believing God can do it in me. But he can't do it in Sarah. Abraham getting up to 100 years of age now. And he believes God can use him to produce something. But he looks at his wife that's 25 years younger than him and says, I just don't think he can do it in you. Here's when you miss God. When you believe he can do it in you. But you don't believe he can do it in the people God sent to you. That's good. Amen. Here's when you miss God. When you believe, well, I can have a blessed marriage if it wasn't for my wife. Honey, God gave you that wife. You'd have been in prison. I could do something if I, if I just had the right people. It's one thing to have faith God can do it in you. But real faith is when you start believing God can do it in the people he sent to you. Real leadership would not be me sitting up here saying God can use me. Real leadership is when I dare to believe that God can use the people he sent me. Those with the needle marks in their veins. Those that have been in prison five years. Real 
makers be saying, God, whosoever you sin, you can raise them up to change this community. And the reason a lot of preachers miss God is they believe he can use them. But they don't believe he can use the people he sent. They believe, oh, yes, I'm God's man of power. God can use me. If I were to sit you down and ask you, what do you believe? Let me talk to you. What do you believe? Some of you say, I believe in the Trinity. I believe in Jesus. I believe in speaking in tongues. I believe in his. I believe in that. And now it sounds real spiritual. I believe in God. Hallelujah. But what if I were to ask you, let's cut through all that. What do you believe about yourself? Because I found out the breakdown is what we believe about ourselves and the people that God sent to us. Somehow Abraham believed in himself that God could do what he said he would do. But Sarah, he starts saying, mm, you're getting old, Sarah. And Sarah comes up with the idea. Now notice, if he'd come up with this idea, the story would have ended because she would kill him. But Sarah comes up with an idea. Have you considered my servant Hagar? Can you imagine if your wife walked up to you and asked that question? Let me help you, Chase. That's a loaded question. <laughs> All you husbands on Father's Day, I'm going to help you live. If your wife ever comes up to you and says, did you look at so-and-so and do you think she's pretty? Do not answer. <laughs> Shut your mouth. Speak in tongues. Pass out. Prophesy. Do something. Because you're being set up. So she asks him. She says, have you considered my servant Hagar? And he said, well, now to mention it, she's a pretty girl. Boom. The mistake happened. Now he goes into Hagar. Y'all know the story. I'm trying not to be explicit. He goes into Hagar. Hagar conceives a child. And Abraham says, well, that's the promise then. But the problem was that wasn't the promise. That came from his flesh, not from his spirit. And how many things have we produced by the flesh and tried to call it the promise of God? How many times do we do stuff in the flesh and then try to blame it on God? There is flesh and there is spirit. And we got to know the difference. Because a lot of times we do stuff in the flesh and we try to say, that's God. No, that ain't God that you've been ignorant. I saw somebody roll out of a chair, chair one time, bust the lady's nose, and act like the Holy Ghost made her do it. The Holy Ghost didn't make you do that stupidity. Did. That's why I keep a lockdown on some of this stuff in this church, because I've seen a lot of people do stuff in the flesh. And make a mockery of my God. And I just want somebody to know Pentecost is real. The power of God is real. And when the Spirit of God does it, you will know it was His Spirit. But I've seen flesh do stuff. And take the credit. I've seen flesh do stuff. And make a mess. And say, well, that was God. That wasn't God, Abraham. That was all you. And before I get too hard on Abraham, how many times have I done stuff? And blame it on God. Okay. How many times have you done this? And blame it on God. How many times have we tried to help God out and made a bigger mess of things? Because that's what happened here. Abraham tried to help God out. And he ended up making a mess. And he tried to act like it was a promise and treat it like a promise. But somewhere in his spirit, he knew it wasn't a promise. And in process of time, God did what he said he would do. And Sarah conceived the mare son. And his name was Isaac. And they knew it was the miracle child. Because her womb was past due. Abraham's body was past due. And when you looked at him holding this baby, you knew it wasn't by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of God. Can I tell you, God wants to do something so big in your life that your family has to step back and say, look what the Lord That your hater has to say, look what the Lord has done. God wants to touch you so much. There's no doubt that it was the hand of God on you. There's no doubt that it wasn't you. There had to be a God that was for you, Ellis. There had to be a God that done that in that boy. There had to be a God that raised that girl. When Abraham and Sarah, these old rickety bodies, held this baby, there was no doubt this baby came from God. I just want somebody to dream again. I want you to know God wants to do something so big that when they look at you, they say there's no doubt that person's blessing came from God. Tell her, Charlie, God wants to do something so big that they look at you and say, look what God has done in that couple. John, the Eric A. wants to do something in your marriage that they look back and say, look what God has done for this family. When God does something, there's no denying that God did it. But now we got a problem, Cody. 
Because we got Isaac and Ishmael in the same house. Woo! We got the miracle and the mistake in the same house, Brother Ron. We got ourselves, as old timers would say, a situation. Because you got two women with two babies by the same man. We got Jerry Springer on crack right here in Genesis chapter 21. And one day they're going to throw a party for Isaac because he's come of age. But as they're throwing the party for Isaac, Sarah fixing stuff in the kitchen looks out the window and she sees Ishmael making fun of Isaac. She sees the mistake making fun of the miracle. And if we ain't careful, we mess up. And sometimes we let our mistakes make fun of what God has done. We let what we did wrong make fun of what God made right. I'm talking about right. See, the devil wants them to come up together. That when your promise comes of age, your mistake makes fun of your miracle. Have you ever seen people that were anointed? But every time you get ready to brag on them, somebody think, well, yeah, but I, I know that, but this about that person. I know that about that person. And they let the mistakes make fun of Americans. Because somebody, well, I got Jesus in my heart. You got Jesus in your heart. I still got Papa in my bone. Come on, somebody. You can have Jesus in your heart, but you still got that DNA in you. If it was all Jesus, would none of you ever get mad? If all you had was Jesus, wouldn't none of you have no mistakes to press on through? If all you had was Jesus, well, I went to the water and I got baptized. I came up doing better and all this stuff. That sounds great. But you know you got Papa in your bone. You know in that house you got the Lord in your heart. But you still got some flesh you deal with. You still got some issues. I know y'all ain't going to talk back to me right now. But you know every now and then that temper tries to flare up. You know every now and then that old thought pattern tries to flare up. And it tries to mess with what God is doing in your life. She looked out and she saw Ishmael making fun of Isaac. I know what it's like to have my Ishmael make fun of my Isaac. I know what it's like to have my flesh try to abort what God was doing in the spirit. Has there anybody that's ever fought that battle between flesh? and spirit. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And that's where we all find ourselves. We got a spirit that wants to grab it. Say, yes, Lord. But we all got some flesh. Yes, we got Jesus in our heart. But you got flesh, you got this. And sometimes that flesh gets in the way of what God wants to do, Dad. Sometimes it messes with you, Father. Sometimes it struggles with you. And you know what? Most of the time, men die 10 years before the spouse. Why? Because men fight battles that you never know about. Men cry tears you'll never see. The biggest battle men fight, we celebrate the John Waynes and the storming of the beaches of Normandy because you think that's man's battle. And it is. But the biggest battle ever man fights in here, you'll never see him swing. You'll never see him bleed. Because if you fight internally, sort of like you bleed internally. If you fight in private, maybe, you bleed in private. That's why men can act like everything's okay and drop dead of a heart attack. Because we don't know how to grab tissue, call a few friends, and sit around and cry about it. Because we were taught to be a man. I just want somebody to know it's hard sometimes to be a man. It's hard sometimes to be a father. Yeah, a father ain't somebody that can biologically produce a child. A father's somebody that can be there while the child's growing up. A father, a father is somebody that's got its back. If you any old piece of our flesh can turn like a baby, then it takes a father to be a dad. I can't get no help in it. And it ain't easy being a father. And if you're going to be a good father, you're going to need help from the heavenly father. Am I right about it? Yeah. And he may make mistakes, but at the end of the day, the good daddy will say, Babies, you need Jesus just as bad as I do. Holler back at this preacher. A real daddy tells him about the Lord. If you're looking for a perfect father, you'll find one. And that's God. The rest of us fathers, we all just try to make it. We all just go through the motions. 
and just believe in God and their own struggles, their own problems. But men, we don't know how to tell you. We're scared. I mean, I ain't never been scared, but I've read books about it. <laughs> we don't know how to tell you that we feel like we're faint. That's why the man can just be driving down the road and have a massive heart attack and die because he's fighting eternal battles and he ain't got nobody to tag on to. He ain't got nobody that comes. Carlene goes to bed, she's got that phone because she's talking to her friends. I rebuke the cell phone light every night. And when she wakes up every morning, she's got that phone, right? So she's talking to her friends. I'm like, what do y'all have to talk about? Women talk about things. We don't know how to talk. Women say, you know, I was just so frustrated. I was just so frustrated because my husband came home and he didn't notice that I had changed flowers. We're never going to notice that you changed flowers. Have you ever felt like you're going home to booby traps? Like she did something and if you don't notice it, you're going to be on three days suspension. You ever done that? We don't know men are headlines. Women are details. Carmen will say what happened. And I'll tell her the end result. This is what happened. I said this, that happened. Boom. She goes, no, well, what was her facial expression when you said it? What were they wearing? Where were you standing? And I don't remember. Because men are different than women. I said men are different. For all you gender equal people that's confused, men are different than women. I'm going to say men are different than women. If that ain't PC enough for you, men are different than women. Now that we've cleared up that confusion, can't even watch social media. Well, I'm a pansexual. No, you having a nervous breakdown. We screwed up a generation with pronouns and terminology while men fight a private hell. Don't even know who to tap on to. Men are sitting there. Because we ain't worried about your little pronouns. We're how am I going to get my kids out of this? How am I going to hold my marriage together? How am I going to keep doing this 10 years from now? I mean, that's what I've heard of people think. <laughs> How am I going to put up with one more thing getting on my nerves? If one, if one more person asks me to do a wedding and can their dog bring the ring down the aisle, let me tell you, no, they cannot. <laughs> I don't care about your dog. Keep it out of the way. I'm just saying what, what I think other people do. Not that I've ever been. Frustrated, or aggravated, or agitated. But I've read books about people that are. And we've raised up a generation of men that are dying. Because we don't know who to talk to. And what if we use the wrong word? What if we aren't PC when we say it? So we just grit our teeth, grit our hands, and we die. Because we don't know how to tell somebody, yes, there's a miracle in my life. There's some mistakes I've made along the way. There's some struggles I have. And Abraham left to himself. Ishmael would have killed Isaac in the house. But God will never leave a man to himself. It was his wife, Sarah, that said, Abraham, I saw your Ishmael make a fun of your Isaac. And it's got to go. Let me help you. If you're ever going to be the man that God God called you to be, you better realize you better have a Sarah standing beside of you. You better have a co-pilot in that cockpit somewhere or you're going to have some blind spots because we've all got blind spots. Have you ever met people that have blind spots? They can see everything, but they got one blaring spot in their life that they just need somebody that loves them enough to tell them this is a blind spot you need to deal with. Sarah was the one that had enough influence in Abraham that when she saw the blind spot, she said, Husband, you better deal with this thing before he deals with you. On this Father's Day, I just came to tell somebody something. You better deal with this thing before he deals with you. 
Because in this house of faith, we've all got miracles and mistakes in the same house. And sometimes we got to deal with the mistake or it's going to abort our miracle. That's good preaching. Amen, Mary. Good job. I just want somebody. I can't let my Ishmael kill my Isaac. And I can't let the weakness of my flesh abort the promise of my spirit. So every now and then, i got to have somebody that talks to me. Abraham had had this good woman that he had counted out. The Twelve tribes would have never been born. But because Abraham had a Sarah, the promise of God was preserved. I know you're all that in a bag of chips. But if you're going to be the dad, the man, the person God called you to be, you're going to have to have somebody speaking into your life. Because the Bible says, somebody said the Bible says, the Bible said it is not good for man to be alone. But yet as you sit here, sir, as Cody begins to play, I found out you can be in a church with a person on each side of you and still be alone. I found out you can be married, be the CEO, still be alone. I found out you can be a pastor, be alone. I found out that alone has nothing to do with physical location has everything to do with your emotional position. Are you alone? Are you bleeding on the inside? Frustration, you look on the face of people. People more frustrated than they ever were, Randy. It would break my heart if I ever saw frustration change Randy's demeanor because he's always been meek and kind and humble. But I have seen inner battles change the countenance of a man. I've seen inner struggles take a sweet, loving person and turn them into a cold-hearted somebody. Because if you ain't got nobody to talk to, you ain't got nobody to tag off to, God looked down and said, Adam, I can't leave you to yourself. Me and Carlene, we have a covenant. I die first. Because she knows she can leave me to myself. I think about Herbie and Cheryl. I think about her all the time. Herbie left six months after Cheryl because he, she's the one that kept me going all them years. It is not good for man to be alone. Don't leave me alone. I mean, don't embarrass me, but don't leave me alone. Let me have somebody. I ain't got to have everybody, just somebody. Don't, don't leave me to myself. Because if you leave me to myself, my mistake is liable to overtake my miracle. And we remember Abraham because of the miracle, all because he had somebody in his life that helped him deal with the mistake. And can I tell you something about this great mistake that he made? If it hadn't been for the mistake, the promise would have died. I'm about to flip it on somebody. Because if you go 50 years down the line, you find his promised grandson, Joseph, in a pit. And they were going to kill him. But who came to get him out of the pit? The Ishmaelites. The descendants of Ishmael. So where Abraham messed up in one season, God anointed it. And 50 years later, he used it to deliver the promise. Go ahead, bow. Go ahead and raise them hands. If you're in here, have you ever had the mistake in the mirror growing up at the same time I have? Have you ever had the best of times and the worst of the times at the same time? I have. Don't let your mistake talk you out of a miracle. God knew he was going to make that state, mistake before you made it. It's not greater than your miracle. Quit letting your circumstances preach to you, Abraham. Start preaching to your circumstances. Start telling your problems about your God. People of faith, they know that faith is voice activated. And when you begin to speak the word of God, it activates your faith in a circumstance. It activates your faith in a situation. And I know this is a unique message for Father's Day. I shared this with Carlene. 
And God began to just settle in on me about me and dying alone, struggling alone. Man, that got real to me. Because how many times would I have not made it if it wasn't for mama? How many times would I have not made it if it wasn't for people in my life that were anointed of God to help me keep going? If you're in here today, and your mistake is trying to overtake your miracle, and you feel like you're battling alone, and you say, I just need God to touch me today. I'm going through a private hell. I prayed for a specific altar call. For a specific altar call. And when I said that about the internal battle and the internal bleeding, I felt something shift in somebody's spirit say, that's you, that's you, that's you. If that's you, man, woman, boy, or girl, if that was you, I want you to step out of that seat right now and I want you to come to this altar. The private battle, the battle they don't even see, they don't even know about, but it's real and it's raging. You need to come right now on this Father's Day.